In this video, we will redesign the pneumatic accelerator and celebrate that with the perfect shot. So here comes season two of this video series. After manually counting thousands of different fasteners for products I sold online, I have built counting machines to do that for me. The design is based on some fundamental principles and it is parametric, so it should work for a variety of conveyed parts. In season 2 of this video series, it's time to speed up. More tools, more machines, more modules, more complexity and hopefully a fraction more videos. Similar to last season, we will go over the components and how I built them. If all goes well, the videos will end with a working modular production system. No matter if it's a single machine, multiple machines or an entire cluster. I have spent the last months locked up in the workshop and it was worth it. There has been huge progress, um, but more about that later. First, I want to discuss a problem that appeared. And it's a problem with a part that actually might look familiar to some of you. In video 4 we built this pneumatic accelerator. This is the pneumatic accelerator that takes the parts stored in the magazine and shoots them to the tube. To do this, the screws are ejected from the magazine and fall onto a ramp. Next, a blast of air pushes them forward. This is a very simple approach to do it, but using compressed air to feed parts is kind of a manufacturing standard. Almost every time something is bolted together automatically, parts are supplied in this way. A tube is flexible and therefore whatever is connected to it can still move. It doesn't matter if it's a robot, a gantry or anything else. Getting parts from the feeder through the tube reliably is essential. However, after testing a lot of different parts, it turns out that for unknown reasons, some parts come out upside down. And that's bad, very bad. No matter which end effector tries to process the part, orientation matters. This is one of the problem candidates. So how does this one reverse its orientation? I mean, what's so different about it that it doesn't work while the other two show no problem? Let's check the three parts in detail. So I cut open three components. Remember, we want the parts to get into the tube tail first. The first part is behaving perfectly. Very repeatable, very nice. With the second part, a lot more is going on. It's a sequence of collisions. But at least over the parts I tested it, it didn't fail. But now watch what happens with part 3. This occurs about every 10 screw and at first I was confused because the part should work better than the short screw. But after watching it frame by frame, I think I know what is happening. Both parts hit the ramp perfectly, both bounce off. The parts start to rotate around their center of gravity. The short screw doesn't manage to rotate very far and collides with the ramp again. For the longer screw, however, there is way more airspace to turn. It has all this airspace thanks to its absurdly large head. This makes it collide much earlier giving it way more time to turn. In other words, 
its head is too big. I mean, I can calculate the trajectories and adjust the shape, but the calculations have too much uncertainty to make this design truly parametric. Therefore, I think we should scrap this design. So that means we need a new way to get the parts from the magazine into the tube. I remember a comment from Ted Markson under the last video. And I think it's really interesting and worth a try. I think what he means by that is to not turn the parts first and put them in the tube, but to let the tube come in horizontally and shoot the parts. More like it would happen inside of a rifle. I see some problems with this approach. Um, most importantly that we bring parts to a standstill inside of a very complex geometry instead of just stopping them inside of the simple tube. But I haven't found any specific reason to why this won't work and therefore let's just try it and see what happens. This is my interpretation of Ted's comment. The screws that are stored in the magazine fall down into the chamber and are then launched by the airflow. I added a gate with a bi-stable mechanism that can be used for manual unloading. That might be practical for testing. The pivot point of this gate is off-center, so that the impact of the parts is unable to force it open. Ok, now let's check if this actually works. To test it, I made this quick setup. And remember, the whole point of this redesign is to ensure the parts come out with the right orientation. Tail first. Wait, what? No, not again. Why is this one backwards? If there is any way things can go wrong, they will go wrong. Like screws will just always find a way. It seems as if the plastic of the impact area does not dampen the collision enough. And that causes especially light parts to flip. Which is, ironically, exactly the problem we wanted to solve with this. And there are no more new problems. Sometimes parts get stuck on the edge between the printed part and the tube. And the aerodynamic efficiency is very poor, which is bad because compressed air is actually quite expensive. You need a lot of energy to do compress it and uh, therefore your electricity bill will go up. However, I think I have found a solution for all of these problems. But the solution is a bit controversial. I mean, it can't flip if it can't bounce. Basically, I read it the entire thing and separated it into two components. But why and how does that solve the bounce problem? The parts fall out of the magazine into the tube. The idea is that we create a vacuum about 25 milliseconds before they actually hit the bottom of the tube. That way they cannot bounce because we suck them into the constraint space before the impact. The vacuum gets created by this brick by shooting compressed air through it. This airflow pulls the air out of the main tube which should create a pretty strong vacuum. But before we test it, let me show you some of the additional features that I have built in. 
there is a spring-loaded steel ball that allows the magazine to be loaded. This feels very satisfying. The amount of snap is adjustable via a set screw that changes the spring tension. The main component itself consists of two parts and the tube is held in place by o-rings that are cut in half. Okay, now after all this work, let's see if this actually works. I have to say it actually works extremely well. To time the airflow I used a sensor that I have built a couple of weeks ago. And based on how far the parts fly through the room when you shoot them out of the tube, it seems that we are using the compressed air now much more effectively. And the design is super parametric. All of this combined means that we can finally call the pneumatic accelerator done, at least for now. And I want to celebrate that with something that I call the perfect shot. This is really not easy. The time slot we have to hit is only 4 milliseconds wide. That is 20 times faster than the blink of human eye. But after a lot of tries, I got this. I am clearly biased, but this has to be the coolest shot in screw feeding history. This perfection coming out of 2 meters fish tank tubing. I thought I'd end this video with a quick update on why there hasn't been a video for so long and what I've been doing in the meantime. I pretty much locked myself into the basement because I wanted to work through some technical difficulties left without getting distracted. There have been hundreds of smaller changes, but the biggest significant one is electronics. We made an entirely new control board that is super awesome for two reasons. The same board can control the feeders, the magazine sprockets and even the conveyor, all with the same hardware. It runs a real-time operating system, has a simple I.O. logic interface to connect to pretty much any third-party industrial controller, and with it, the feeder is incredibly power efficient. Also, multiple feeders can now be connected via CAN bus. CAN bus is a standard that is mainly used in automotive, but it has a lot of advantages here too. And for example, we can even do firmware updates over the network, which is completely awesome. But really the second and most important reason why this thing is so brilliant is that it's the first thing that I've shown here that I didn't have to do completely alone. I had some help from actually uh, one of you, a German viewer who offered to help me um, and who is now the first employee. And Clemens is really way better at embedded electronics than I am. And his fantastic work is the main reason why this turned out so well. Additionally, I have pivoted the entire business model, uh, which is in itself kind of an, let's call it interesting story. Um, I know many of you are interested in more details on that side, and there will be news about this next week. If you don't want to miss all of this, then hit the subscribe button and I will see you 
in the next video.